All right, good afternoon. Uh, if you haven't already picked up one of the bulletins, uh, please do. It's going to be uh, really helpful. There might be one sitting on a, de a chair next to you, but you can grab it. Uh, we're going to be going through uh, this, uh, this afternoon a topic called Making, Disci Making Disciples, which is part one of our series, Mysterious Figures in Early Christianity. It's uh, a series that I'm, I'm personally super excited about. Uh, reason being is that we oftentimes speak about the church fathers. We talk about, you'll hear me say, the fathers said, or these fathers have said this and that, and, and people oftentimes wonder who in the world are these people called the fathers. So over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, a number of different time periods and eras and what was happening in the early church, specifically during those first four or five centuries. Uh, which is that, that time period that most people would refer to as the period of the church fathers or the patristic era. Now, today's talk in particular, we're going to be looking at that, the, the, the disciples or the apostles and the next generation of fathers that came right, or the next generation of disciples that came right after the apostles, which we refer to as the apostolic fathers. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20, our Lord Jesus Christ, speaking to his disciples, he told them that you should go therefore and make disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always. We would expect that when Jesus made his disciples, and one of the last things that he says to his disciples is, you also go forth and make disciples, that we should, at some point in history, know who those disciples of the disciples were. What we're going to do to begin with, before we get into the disciples of the disciples, is just kind of highlight the apostles, and we're going to look at a few of them in particular. The, the apostles, the usual suspects, the people who followed Christ, sometimes in scripture they're referred to as the apostles, sometimes they're referred to as the disciples. Okay? Anyone know the difference between an apostle and a disciple? What's a disciple? A follower. What's an apostle? One who sent. Good. So, in, in scripture, you'll find that distinction of a disciple. There were not just the 12, not just the 70. There were hundreds of disciples that followed Jesus. They walked after him. They perhaps were his pupils or his students. And a student in those days didn't learn sitting in a classroom, but they oftentimes walked with their master. Okay? An apostle is someone who is also a disciple, but they are perhaps also, in addition to following him, are sent out to carry the message that they have received from their master. Now, one of the things about the apostle is, or someone who's a disciple rather, a disciple is simply to take what the master has given to him or her and keep it. An apostle is to take that and share it with others as is. It is not the right or the responsibility or the authority of a disciple or an apostle to change the message. It's for that reason, St. Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verse 9, tells, the, tells the, the church in Asia Minor that if anyone, even an angel, comes and changes the, the gospel that I preach to you, let them be anathema, let them be cut off from you. Okay? So the role of the apostle is to take what they have received as a disciple and to simply deliver it to others. In scripture, sometimes you'll find a distinction between 70 or 72, right? Anyone heard of, sometimes you hear the number 70, sometimes you hear 72. The, the, the distinction comes from the fact that half of the scrolls in early, uh, the, those first couple of centuries, mention the number 70 while the other half mentioned the number 70, 72, okay? Within the Orthodox Church, we usually emphasize the number 70, 
But that's where you'll find, even in some in translations, NIV, NRSV, NKJV, others, you'll find some, depending on which scrolls they use, some would say 70, some would say 72. It's not a major problem that we're talking about, okay? This is not one of those uh, uh, things that is different that should worry people and they say, but how, how come this is, it's, it's not that serious of a distinction, okay? So these apostles are then sent out. We know that of the 70, there was a man, his name was Mark, who came to Egypt and went to Libya and northern Africa, and he preached, okay? This was the same Mark who was not one of the 12, but he was one of the 70 who was ultimately sent out. By Christ, he, walked, he, he had some missionary journeys with Paul and Barnabas, and ultimately he left them, and Paul was, there was a rift between the two of them. But he, as a result, thankfully, <laughs> ends up leaving and coming to northern Africa where he preaches in Alexandria. So we've got the 70. Let's come a little bit closer to the, the 12. The 12, 12 we find in Luke chapter 6, verse 13, it, it mentions the 12. It says, and when it, was, and when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. So he calls all his disciples together and he says, I'm selecting you 12 to be my core group, if you will, okay? And he names them apostles. Now, don't get confused if sometimes the scripture uses the word disciple, others apostle. You know it's simply a disciple is someone who follows and an apostle is someone who is sent out. There wasn't this very clear delineation in scripture about these are the 12 and 70 of disciples and apostles. The language is sometimes used interchangeably. We just use the word 12 and uh, 70 apostles or disciples and 12 apostles. We use that to distinguish in our minds, okay? But he calls them and he calls from those disciples the 12 whom he also named apostles. In other words, these disciples were ready to be sent out. From the, 12, from the 12 that are listed here, we've got St. Philip, St. James, St. Jude, Thomas, Andrew, John, Matthew, Bartholomew, Simon, James, Peter, and there's another one in there, Paul. Okay, and we're going to come to him because he's not originally one of the 12. Within the 12, there's a group known as the inner circle or the inner core, okay? And that is the inner core. The three persons are, anyone? Who are the inner core? Uh huh. Peter, John, and James. Good. Peter, church history has told us that Peter is the founder of the church in Antioch. And he wrote two epistles. Contrary to what some people suggest, Peter did not establish, history tells us that Peter did not establish the church in Rome but rather he was crucified head down in Rome during the reign of Nero. But St. Peter is known throughout the Gospels as one of the outspoken disciples. He's also in the first half of the book of Acts, and he writes two epistles which are in the scripture. He ultimately is martyred again, and he, as church tradition tells us, he requests that he would not be crucified like the Lord, but that he would be crucified head down. The second one, Second and third are brothers, James and John. And these brothers are also known as the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, okay? You could imagine that they were a force to be reckoned with, okay? But James and John have their own unique path. James is, is martyred by Herod Agrippa I in the year AD 44. He's the first of the 12 to suffer martyrdom. John, on the other hand, is the only one of the 12 that doesn't suffer martyrdom. He goes to Ephesus, as church history would tell us, he goes to Ephesus, St. Mary goes, our Lord entrusts St. John to care for his mother because of the closeness of the relationship. 
He cares for her in Ephesus, and during his time there, he establishes several churches. It's at that time that he is exiled to this small island called Patmos. On that island is where he writes the book of Revelation. Okay? During his time in exile, near the year 90 AD, which is when the final text in the canon of Scripture is finished being written. In addition, St. John writes four other books, or four books are attributed also with his name. I'll take the easy one, the Gospel of John. What are the other three? I'll give you a hint. Uh -huh. First John, first epistle of John, second epistle of John, and third epistle of John, okay? So you got it, yes. Okay, good. All right. So these are the inner circle of our Lord. These are his closest disciples you find in the Garden of Gethsemane and in the Mount on Transfiguration. These three are present with the Lord. Then there are the other nine. The other nine who are also very precious to him. And each one of these nine has, finds their own fate. I'll just mention a few of them. Andrew was originally a disciple of John the Baptist. Okay, he's originally a disciple of John the Baptist. He is martyred, crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. And since it's become that X-shaped cross has become known as St. Andrew's Cross, okay, and is now the flag of Scotland. Okay? You'll, whenever you see the flag of Scotland, you'll see it's a blue background. Oh, the, that is the, the cross of St. Andrew. He's the patron saint of Scotland. Philip leads Nathaniel to Christ. He's also present in the feeding of the 5,000, told to buy bread. And that's when he responds to the Lord, how will we feed all these people? Where am I going to find bread for all of these people? Philip preaches in Carthage in Asia Minor. He is crucified. Church history tells us that he sought to convert the Roman proconsul's wife, and as a result of that, he's crucified. Just look at a few more. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, according to Eusebius, he visits India between, he vi sorry, th this disciple named Pantanius of Alexandria visits India between the year 150 to 200 AD. When he goes there, he finds the Gospel of Matthew, that again, church history tells us, was left by Bartholomew. Okay? And he's ultimately flayed, he's skinned and killed in Armenia. Uh, because of preaching. There's another disciple that goes to India and preaches. Who's that other disciple? Thomas. Thomas, Thomas also goes to India. He preaches both in Syria and in India. Church history tells us that he was also killed on the streets of India. Matthew preaches in Palestine, Syria, Persia, and Ethiopia. He's stabbed to death in Ethiopia. James the Lesser, Simon the Zealot, Jude. Interestingly, he's always referred to as Judas, not Iscariot. Wouldn't you love to have that name, right? My name is Judas, not Iscariot. Okay, that's how he is distinguished in Scripture. He's also known as Thaddeus, and then of course Judas Iscariot, who's replaced later in the book of Acts by Matthias after he commits suicide. Okay. On your handouts, you'll see that there's one more born out of time. And that one more born out of time is St. Paul. God bless you. St. Paul refers to him as the, himself as the one born out of time. He says, then last of all, he was seen by me also. So he goes through all the people that he sees, or all the people that see Christ, the risen Christ. And he says, finally, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I'm the least of the apostles, who I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. He's saying, although I'm an apostle, although God has called me and commissioned me specifically to be sent out to share the good news, he says, I acknowledge that I'm not worthy to carry that message out because of my own work of persecution on the church. 
Now, if you look on, on the handout, on the, the back side, you'll see a section called the Sayings of the Father. Sayings of the Fathers. And on that, I'm giving you a quote by St. Athanasius his, uh, in one of his letters to Serapion. And in it, he says, beyond these scriptures, beyond these scriptures, beyond these scriptural sayings, let us look at the very tradition, teaching, and faith of the Catholic Church from the beginning, which the Lord gave the apostles preached and the fathers kept. So St. Athanasius is talking about two things. He's talking about the centrality, the importance of Scripture. And he's saying, but beyond these, beyond these scriptural writings, let's look at the very tradition and teaching from the beginning the Lord gave, the apostles preached, the fathers kept. The Lord gave, the apostles preached, the fathers kept. Okay? And that's really what we're going to be looking at today and the next few weeks. Who and what are these writings that St. Athanasius is talking about here? Today we're going to be starting a discussion on an era called the Apostolic Era. And we're going to look at nine specific texts or seven persons and two texts that are not attributed to a person and we're going to be looking through a little bit about their text, but I'm going to be giving you a historical overview of them and encourage you to start doing some reading on some of these beautiful texts that I think are very useful to us when understanding and engaging with the scripture. When trying to understand the culture of what was going on in first century and second century Palestine, Jerusalem, Syria, Alexandria, beyond, these texts are very helpful and useful for us to put us in the frame of mind when we're reading the scripture that points us to Christ. And one of the things that you'll find with these fathers is they relied heavily on the scripture themselves. The first text we'll look at is referred to the Didache's number under number two on your handout. The Didache was written around the year, it's dated somewhere between the year 50 to 100 AD. And it's the earliest surviving catechism. And a catechism is simply something that teaches people how to live as a Christian. Okay? So it's the earliest surviving catechism we find. And its contents can really be broken down into four main sections. The first section is known as the two ways, the way of life and the way of death. It's six chapters, okay? We've studied this before in our Orthodox Foundations course as part of the discovery courses. And one of the other texts that also has, starts off this way is the Epistle of Barnabas. Actually, it concludes, the Epistle of Barnabas concludes with the two ways, okay? But in the two ways, when it starts off, he starts off, or the, the, the collector of the, the Didache, which simply means the teaching, it's oftentimes attributed as the teaching of the Twelve. It begins with the Shema. And then after the Shema, it goes to the greatest commandments, which is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Why would the collector of the teaching of the Twelve do that? What, what's, what's being done here is that Christianity is being positioned as the completion and the fulfillment of Judaism. Okay? That Christ, in fact, is the fulfillment of the prophets, as we find in, uh, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the Law and the Prophets. So he begins this way, and then he goes through, the, the text goes through and offers a number of things that we should do if we want to find life and some things that we should do to avoid death. And as part of the things that he, that, that the text rather prohibits, it prohibits magic, sorcery, infanticide, abortion, amongst a whole slew of other uh, prohibitions on the things that lead to the way of death. In the second section, chapter 7 to 10, the text takes us through early practice of baptism. It's super fascinating. It talks about, there's all this debate, should people be dunked, should they be sprinkled, should they be, what should happen? Okay? And the text actually makes it very simple. 
if there's living water, which is basically like a running stream, dump, they, the, the person should be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in living water. Why living water? We, I was asked this question, and I had to just recently look it up. Why living water? Because if water was stagnant, it was more likely to be filled with what? Bacteria and disease and sedentary, right? So living water so that the person wouldn't get diseased when they're baptized. If that's not available, then they should be baptized in a basin. And if that's, if you still don't have enough water, then sprinkle name of Father, Son, th Holy Spirit three times. Interestingly, in the basin, they said, if you have cold water, use cold water. But if cold water is not available, use warm. Again, there's not anything more spiritual about cold as opposed to warm. But again, it's the same issue. It's for cleanliness purposes, okay? So he goes through baptism, goes through the idea of the Eucharist, and it has some beautiful Eucharistic prayers. You find very early on that the church was Eucharistic, okay? And in addition, that there's some discussion on the practice of fasting. Who else fasted two days a week? It was the Jews, right? They fasted Mondays and Thursdays. Well, the, the writer doesn't explain why, but it says we don't fast with the hypocrites, is the language he uses. He says, instead of fasting Mondays and Thursdays, no, we fast Wednesday and Friday. We find later in one of the documents called the Apostolic Constitution that the explanation that's given is Wednesday is the day of betrayal of Judas, Friday is the day of crucifixion, okay? And presumably, a person when they fasted would take some of the, the food that they would normally eat and give it to the poor. Their, this fasting, by the way, was not just eating vegetarian. This fasting was not eating food the entire day from sunrise to sunset on Wednesdays and Fridays. Then there's a portion about ministry and dealing with traveling prophets and finally a brief apocalypse. I, I won't go deep into, deeper into the text but it's a very beautiful text. You can find all of these, by the way, online. Um, if you have trouble finding them, please let me know. One of the next characters that is a very, very important character is a man by the name of Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome lives in the year, um, he dies rather in the year 99 AD. He's the second figure on your handout. He is most likely the second or the third bishop of Rome. And church history tradition tells us that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, the Clement that's mentioned in there is most likely this Clement of Rome. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Again, Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. He wrote, or there's two texts that are attributed to him. The first one is called 1 Clement or 1 Corinthians. Some people tongue-in-cheek refer to it as 3 Corinthians, okay? And basically what we find with Clement, what he's doing here is as the Bishop of Rome, he is reaching out to this church in Corinth and he's following some of the same topics, some of the same themes that St. Paul's addressing in his pastoral letters, okay? And so... In, in so doing, some of the themes that he mentions are repentance, maintaining harmony. Like, the church in Corinth was a problem church, right? They were constantly bickering and sectarianism and fighting. So we find this theme continuing, a call to maintain harmony, order, unity, resurrection. And in it, he talks about this idea of church order. And he talks specifically about the, 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 the bishops and the deacons who some of them had been deposed, they had been put off because some conflicts that were happening. And what Clement tells the leadership in Corinth at the time, he says, bring them back so that they can offer up the gifts. What were the gifts that were being offered up? The Eucharist, okay? So he repeatedly refers to the Old Testament as scripture. Not yet, at this point in 99 AD, we're not yet referring to the New Testament as scripture. Okay? The only time he refers to 
anything as scripture is when he's reading the Old Testament. The third person on your handout is a disciple by the name of Ignatius of Antioch. He lives between the years 35 and 107 AD. He's a disciple of St. John. Okay, so we're talking, folks, we're, we're talking real close, real close to the time. Like, these people lived with the disciples. These are the next generation of disciples. St. Ignatius is the bishop of Antioch, and he writes seven letters en route to his martyrdom in Rome. And these letters are just, they're a beautiful, beautiful uh, expression of what was going on in the early church at this time, at the end of the first century. There's three main themes that he focuses on. The first is that ecclesiology is composed of the bishops, the presbyters, and the deer. This is, uh, and the deacons, rather, okay? So you have this threefold ecclesiology that's very clearly pro present there. He actually at one point says, wherever the bishop is, there is the church just as where Christ is. There are the people just as where Christ is, there is the church, okay? So the bishop, we find very clearly that there was a very central and important role for the role of the bishop. The sacraments, you can't read any of the writings of Ignatius and miss the Eucharist. Okay? In one of the places he refers to the Eucharist as the medicine of immortality. It is impossible to read the scripture in light of the apostolic era and conclude that Eucharist is just done as a remembrance. It's impossible. You absolutely cannot f reach any other conclusion than that the Eucharist is Christ himself offering himself as his body and his blood to his church. Okay? The next person on your list is a man by the name of Polycarp of Smyrna. Now, in the book of Revelation, you find a list of churches that are mentioned. And one of those seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that's mentioned is the church of Smyrna. And in each of the seven churches, you have a message to an angel. Well, that word angel, angelos, just simply means a messenger. Okay? So... In fact, most biblical scholars suggest that the angel that's being referred to there in, in, Poly, in Smyrna is Polycarp himself. Okay? So St. John is writing this letter. He sends it over to Polycarp, or the, the book of Revelation. It's being circulated amongst them. One of the letters that St. Polycarp writes is an epistle to the church of Philippi. So again, you, you find the disciples of the disciples continuing to share that which they've received. They're disciples, right? And we said a disciple simply is a student who receives. They have no right to change the message. So they're taking the message and conveying it into the lives of the people. In all likelihood, this letter was written around the year 110 to 140 AD. Okay, We're going to look at a couple of texts from Polycarp in uh, the letter to Philippians and some of the things that he mentions. In chapter 5, verse 3, he says, It is right to abstain from all these things, submitting yourselves to the presbyters and deacons as to God in Christ. The virgins must walk in a blameless and pure conscience. There's, there's this reminder, and it's the same thing that you find actually in Corinth and in Hebrews, and St. Paul is calling the people to submit to the church and to the teaching of the church as to, to Christ. You can imagine that people are starting to stand in rebellion and there was conflict. And so he's telling them, he's reminding them, guys, submit yourselves to the teaching of Christ and don't try to change the teaching. Which quite frankly you find there's a reason why he's saying this. There's a number of heresies or wrong teachings that begin to enter. And so they're trying to, as best as possible, protect the teaching as they've received it from Christ. In chapter 6, verse 1, so first he says, submit to the presbyters and deacons. But then after that he says, presbyters, be compassionate, merciful towards all men, 
turning back the sheep that are gone astray, visiting all that are sick or infirm, not neglecting a widow or an orphan or a poor man. Okay? So he's telling the people submit, but then he's telling the presbyters, don't be, don't be like gangster style. Like be loving, be compassionate, be gentle with people, serve them, help them. Don't do like the Gentiles who lord authority over others. And that's what Jesus told his disciples. The reality is we as humans, we have this tendency to want to lord over others. Yes? I mean, we, 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 oftentimes we hunger and thirst for power and control. And that doesn't, we don't find that, we, we, we don't find like that just because a person has become a Christian that somehow that inherent desire for power and control disappears. So they're constantly reminding them and telling the, the, the presbyters, the priests, to be compassionate on the people. Don't shout at the people. Don't yell at them. And if I've yelled at you, I'm sorry. Okay? One of the disciples of Polycarp is a man by the name of Irenaeus of Leones. He lives uh, near the end of the second century. And this is what he says. He says, Polycarp was not only instructed by the apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also by apostles in Asia, appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna. So St. Irenaeus is telling us that Polycarp was instructed by the apostles, and they themselves appointed him to be the bishop of the church in Smyrna. He said, whom I also saw in my early youth, for he tarried on earth a very long time. And when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffering martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles, and which the church has handed down, and which alone are true. These things are the Asiatic churches. All the Asiatic churches testify, as do all those men who have succeeded Polycarp down to the present time. So St. Irenaeus here is telling him, he said, listen, Polycarp was a disciple of the disciples, and I'm his disciple. And we've painstakingly preserved that which Christ had given to the apostles, we have held on and fought to preserve that. In his work, Martyrdom, or it was a work that was written after his martyrdom, it was such a beautiful passage here. It's, it's called the Martyrdom of Polycarp. It says, and when the proconsul pressed him, this, him being Polycarp, and said, swear and I will release you, revile Christ. He says, I want you to curse Christ and I'll let you go free. Remember what, what happened on the, on the beaches of Libya or on the bus, on, on the road to the St. Samuel Monastery? Just renounce your faith in Christ and we'll let you go free. Polycarp says, 86 years have I served him and in nothing has he wronged me. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? How could I ever turn my back and blaspheme the one who who saved me, my king. I don't bow down to the emperor. I bow down to the true king, Jesus Christ. The next one, the fifth one on your handout is the shepherd of Hermes. This is most likely written around the late first, early second century. It was considered scriptural by some, such as Irenaeus and Tertullian. Ultimately, it's left out because one of the requirements that it be included within the corpus of scripture is that a text had to have been written by one of the apostles, okay? So, but the Shepherd of Hermes is a very valuable text. It's, um, it's full of these, um, these visions and poetic por uh, sections. And it's really a call to the faithful to repent of their sins that have harmed the church. I wanna look at two texts in particular. One of them has to do with fasting. The other one has to do with keeping the, God, the Lord's commands. In Shepherd of Hermes chapter 3, or book 3, chapter, uh, sorry, vision 3, chapter 5, section 3, he says, in that day on which you fast, taste nothing but bread and water. Having reckoned up the price of the dishes of that day, which you intend to have eaten, you will give it to a widow or an orphan or to some person in want. And thus you'll exhibit humility of mind so that he who has received benefit from your humility may fill his soul and pray for you to the Lord. He's, he's connecting the notion of fasting with loving others. Fasting with almsgiving. Okay? 
saying whenever you fast, take whatever you would normally use to eat and consume, total that up and give it as a sacrifice for those who are in need. Such a beautiful view of fasting. Oftentimes our view of fasting is very self-focused, very self-centered. And, and, and so it's important that when we fast, it be God-focused and as an expression of our love to God and an expression of love to others. The second section is in um, the, the seventh vision. He says, by keeping God's commandments, you will be powerful in every action. Your action will be beyond criticism. Fear the Lord then and you will do everything well. This is the fear you should have or must have to be saved. Let's go to the last few here. I'm going to go through the, the last four pretty quickly. The, the fourth one is called the Epistle of Diognetus. And this is written around the year 130 to 180 AD. The authorship is traditionally ascribed to Barnabas in the Acts of the Apostles, but there's question as to if that was actually his thought or someone else's thought. But the, the, the best dating that we can find is 130 to 180 AD. Some, uh, some say, uh, suggest that it's earlier, but I'm trying to give you as... Um, as close to what is out there uh, on this section, uh, on this specific text, okay? It's cited by Clement of Alexandria and Origen of Alexandria. So they refer to it. They find that it's a very useful text. I've actually spoken to you all about this text a number of times. And one of the, the things, one of the points that this text talks about is the role of Christians in the world. And the, the, the epistle of Diognetus suggests that in a word, what the, in a world, what, what the soul is to the body, Christians should be to the world. What is a body without a soul? It's dead. It's inanimate, right? And he's suggesting that Christians in the world should be the soul. It should be that which gives life to a gathering. It should give life to others. Okay? The next couple are called the Epistle of Barnabas. The Epistle of Barnabas, written around the year 100. Sorry, I suggested that Diognetus was written by, uh, by Barnabas. That's actually the next one. My apologies on that. The Epistle of Diognetus, the, the authorship is, there's an uncertainty that's there. It's the Epistle of Barnabas that was written around the year 100 to 131 AD, and that's the one that's attributed to Barnabas in the book of Acts. Some of the themes that he addresses here, he says that the Jewish scriptures, their primary role is to serve as a foretelling that Jesus Christ is coming. Number two, the entire Jewish system is abolished in favor of that of our Lord. And number three, the covenant promises belong to Christians. Okay? We don't believe in two different covenants, guys. There is the covenant promise of the old, fulfilled in the new, is given to those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And this also closes with a section called the two ways that we mentioned earlier. We've got two more to look at, all right? The last couple are the fragments of the writings of Papias of Her Her Hierapolis, and this is written in this time period, 60 to 130 AD. And Eusebius in his work, Church History, he actually captures a section of the text. Most of the text was lost. But in this section, there's an emphasis of the point of early tradition, of oral tradition rather. Okay? And you find the origins of the canonical gospels mentioned here as well. Let's, let's read it together. It says, I shall not hesitate also to put into order, ordered form for you, along with the interpretations, everything I learned carefully in the past from the elders and noted down carefully. So he's laying out here the idea of oral tradition. He says, for, tr for the truth of which I vouch. He says, I learned care from the past from the elders and noted down carefully. I took no pleasure in those who told many different stories. This is important, okay? People like to show up and tell all kinds of funny stories. He says, I don't care about those things but only in those who taught the truth. Nor did I take pleasure in those who reported their memory of someone else's commandments. 
but only those who reported their memory of the commandments given by the Lord to the faith and proceeding from the truth itself. And if by chance anyone who has been in attendance of, on the elders arrived, I made inquiries about the words of the elders, what Andrew or Peter had said, or Philip or Thomas, or James or John or Matthew or any of the Lord's disciples, and whatever Erestion and John the elder, the Lord's disciples, were saying, for I did not think that information from the books would profit me as much as information from a living and surviving source. He's, in other words, this last section about a living and surviving source, he's talking about personal instruction. He prefers personal instruction over isolated book learning. In other words, he's saying that Christianity is not about sitting down with a book and just reading a book, but it should be a living and surviving voice. The last text is a short fragment of a writing called by Quadratus of Athens. I know these are a number of texts, that's why I gave you this handout, but please do look them up and read them. It's so beautiful and give you the mind of the early church, what was going on at that time. Again, a section of it is preserved in the work of church history by Eusebius. He says, he himself reveals the early date at which he lived in the following words. So he's, Eusebius is saying now, that Quadratus, and he's quoting Quadratus, okay, he says, but the works of our Savior were always present, for they were genuine. Those that were healed, and those that were raised from the dead, who were seen not only when they were healed, and when they were raised, but were also always present, and not merely while the Savior was on earth, but also after his death. They were alive for quite a while, so that some of them lived even to our day. Okay, so, so, we can tell here that this person lived very early on. He was a disciple who lived during the time of the apostles and most likely died around the year 129 AD. Okay? I want to just wrap up with the idea of discipleship, a methodology of discipleship that we find with Christ, his disciples, and what their disciples did, his disciples did to the next generation of disciples and how we use this ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay? So you find initially that the disciples had an encounter and experience with Christ, right? They met him, he walked up to them, he spoke to them, there was some real concrete experience or encounter. There was a first approach that took place with Christ. After that first experience, it doesn't stop there. There goes on the, the period or the stage called exploration. Exploration is learning from those who have walked before us. It's our own training. It's our own growth. It's about learning from what others have written and said. It's about learning from others and being trained in the life of the church. It's about taking the next step. Oftentimes people stop here. But we've got to move on to the next se section, which is dedication. Dedication is making a commitment to never leave your faith. A commitment to Jesus Christ that we will always walk with Him. A commitment to Christ that we renew day by day every morning we wake up. Oftentimes people say, I made that commitment when I was baptized. I made that commitment, I prayed some prayer, and I committed my life to Christ. But sorry guys, that commitment is not a one and done kind of thing. That commitment is a commitment that I make on a daily basis every single time I wake up. That I am committing myself to walking with Christ and being faithful to him to the end. After I've had that initial encounter, I've explored, I've begun learning and training and, and understanding as his disciple, as a student, I dedicate my life fully to him, I continue to grow. This oftentimes is the period at, at which if, if a person is baptized as, a, as an adult, that this would be that step for those of us who are baptized as, as infants or as young kids. This is also a reminder that we need to do this, not just once, but on a daily basis as well. And finally, it leads to action. And that action is us being sent out into the world. Because otherwise, the cycle breaks. Otherwise, if we're not, if we don't see ourselves to be sent out in the world, how will others experience Christ? I want you to think honestly about your first experience of Christ might have been from your parents, might have been from someone in church, might have been from someone in a grocery store, might have been 
from some homeless person on the street. It might have been from one of your children. But if we think that our work happens inside the four walls of the church, I think we're breaking the cycle of discipleship. If we don't take action to go out into the world and make disciples, the process is broken, the cycle is broken. Our role is to go out and to share Christ with others so that they can have that first experience and then the cycle continues for them. The idea here is that Jesus made disciples and then those disciples made disciples. And we find some really beautiful things that his disciples' disciples wrote and his disciples' disciples witnessed and his disciples' disciples laid their lives down for this, in the same way that the disciples of Jesus Christ did in the same way that Jesus did. And we're part of that lineage. But it's not just enough to have that experience or exploring and, and making it a, a, a book study of, of Jesus or dedicating myself and that's it. I want to really encourage you that we take the next step so we can give someone else a new experience. Christianity is self-replicating. Okay, Christianity constantly, day by day, Christ in us, in the world, is how other people experience Jesus and they themselves come to be disciples of Christ. So this first section, the apostolic era, we talked about the disciples of the disciples who came and they shared what they had received. But by the end of the second century, we find some attacks start coming. And as a result of those attacks coming, we find the church transitioning to a new era, an era of apologetics, an era of defense. And that's what we're going to pick up with next time in the Apo Apologetics Father, which is next Sunday we'll be talking about making a defense or giving a defense. Okay? Any questions?